If you would turn in your Bibles uh, this morning as we continue through the Gospel of Mark, we're in the first chapter, we'll be in the first chapter for a, a couple of uh, weeks yet. We're preaching through uh, the Gospel of Mark. Um, just a, a reminder again that all three churches in our network, uh, Mill Creek Community Church and the Edinburgh Community, Community Church, as well as Harbor Creek Community Church, are all three preaching through the Gospel of Mark. If you uh, listen to uh, those three messages, you would hear three different messages. Uh, I'm encouraged by that. I'm excited about that. We preach the same text. All three churches this morning are are, uh, preaching from uh, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. But um, we've crafted, by God's leading, the Spirit's leading, our own messages. And uh, not that we didn't do that in the past, but there was some resources that we used in the past that uh, maybe if you heard the message message you you might have picked up on some things that we were repeating not so this time so in the gospel of mark this morning we're looking at verses 21 through 28 and it reads this way and they went into capernaum and immediately on the sabbath he entered the synagogue and he was teaching that being jesus And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Father, I pray that... You use me these next few moments that we have together here in ways that honors your name and exalts Christ. In fact, that's our focus here uh, this morning in this message is the authority of Jesus the Christ. So Holy Spirit, I I, I give myself to you. I offer myself to you. My my mind, my my words, my heart uh, lead me in all that I do that it brings encouragement to the body of Christ and conviction to those who need Christ. For we ask this in His name, God's people said. Amen. Amen. So as I mentioned in uh, my prayer, the, the title to this message is The Authority of Jesus. The Authority of Jesus. If I was to give you a takeaway and say, well, if if you didn't hear anything that I said from this point on, I would, I would want you to hear this, that your takeaway, what you want to go home with, is that Jesus, in our text this morning, was given an authority, and it was God-given. It was an authority from God. And what I want you to hear as I close this message later is that that has been passed on to his followers to continue. So let me repeat that. God, the Father, gave to the Son an authority with his words and on the heart of man. And he has given us, as he ascended back to the Father, he has given us the authority as his disciples to carry that on, his message on, with his words. The gist of the message is that the leaders of this day, the, 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 the crowds and the demons that we see in our text, they recognize Jesus' authority, but they don't submit to that authority. They do not submit to that authority. They hear it. They hear the words. They see him. But there's no submission. Jesus has delegated his authority to us, 
his followers, his disciples, with his message of of repentance and, and belief in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But we face the same rejection of that authority with God's word as Jesus did with his words. We face that same rejection. Different people exercise authority in different ways. Like, like for example, a, a general, he, he exemplifies his authority by giving orders. And his expectation is that there'll be strict military discipline based on his authority. A teacher, a teacher exercises his or her her authority by grading the homework or the test and then giving that grade and if it's not done correctly or if there's trouble she exercises her authority or his authority by sending you to the principal's office at least that's what they did in my day that right after they boarded us a teacher does that We can see a busy policeman on the street corners, not in Erie, Pennsylvania, but in the cities of New York, you'll see them with the whistles, and they'll blow that whistle because they're exercising their authority. And if they they see someone not obeying their authority, what do they do? They give them a ticket or a citation. And now we have the tax season, don't we? We have the tax season. So we go file our taxes and we hope everything is done correctly because if not, we'll see the authority of the IRS offices, won't we? We'll see that agent come and there'll be an audit conducted and then he passes out his authority by assessing penalties. So there's different types of authority. There, there's many ways that, that, that people exercise their God-given authority. But how did Jesus, that's the question we're raising today, how did Jesus exercise his authority? Well, he did it in the simplest way that we could even imagine. He just did it with his words. His words carried that authority. The Apostle John records the words of Jesus, the PowerPoint to my right, John 8, 28 says, And Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. I've run ahead of my precious sister. Just wait on me. So John 8, 28, Jesus said, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father has taught me. Matthew 1 in our text this morning, provides several reasons that we must understand the authority of Jesus. Several reasons. We see him taking along with him now his followers as he goes to Capernaum. And that's located on the, on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. I had the privilege of being there a number of years ago. Uh, it's on the Sea of Galilee, a freshwater lake that uh, certainly we know Uh, from our text that was excellent for fishing. And it was a lake that's only seven miles wide and it's 13 miles long, but it had an abundance of fishing. Many made their living and provided food for their families on this huge lake called the Sea of Galilee. But Capernaum is where we find our master, the Lord Jesus, and uh, it's along the shores. It's a a port in Jesus' day. It's It's a very popular port fact, it has a population mixed of Jews and and Gentiles and and Roman soldiers and officials. They're all there. And now we see Jesus is there. This is where Jesus would have his base. He would would be here for some time now. And immediately, immediately upon his arrival, things kick into action right away. He he begins to to teach the crowds and, and, and they learn several things about this about this new teacher. Most important, what they learned was that he had authority. He had authority. All of us, all of us, 
have a source of authority. I want you to think about this just for a moment. Just, just think with me. All of us have a source of authority. Our lives determine how we think and how we live. For some, it's reason. Your authority might be just reason. What do I mean? Well, it's the way you think. In other words, the authority in your life is your thought process, what you think. And then you make a decision based on your thoughts, and that's the authority in your life. For others, it's experience, experience of life. I, I live the way that I live because it's how I feel. It's what I've experienced, and so I'm making my decisions based on my experience. That's the authority in my life. Still others, it's on tradition. I live the way I live because it's always the way it was done, right? You've heard that. So my authority of my life is based on what's always done in the past. And then there are those, there are those who look to revelation for their authority. They, they live the way they live because that's what God says to do. And that's what we see here this morning. Those of us whose authority is revelation, we understand to take the, the form, we understand that it takes the form of the written word and the living word. That's the authority. The written word we call the Bible. And the living word we know is Jesus. We love the Bible. That's our revelation. It's our authority. And we love and worship the Savior, the one who has the authority. So we could say easily that the written word is what points us to the living word. The one, the one who has authority has the right to demand complete and absolute lordship in our lives. That takes us to our text. Because you see, those who see Jesus in the synagogue know he has authority. But they're asking, what's your source? Point number one, the source of this one in authority. We see that it was given by God the Father. His source is from the Father. His authority is from God the the Father, the Creator. John seven sixteen says, Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but it's His who sent me. He later emphasizes how critical it is for those that He was teaching and for us today to know that. How critical it is to know that His very words were the words of God. Think about that. Those of you that have your Bibles on your laps or have the Bible on a digital phone, a phone, and it's digital, do you think for a moment the power that those words have in your life? They are the very words of God who has authority in our lives. Think about that. Listen to what John 12 says. It's not on a PowerPoint. Listen to this. Jesus said, I've not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. I, I find that so compelling. Jesus incarnate came to this earth, God in flesh, and the very words that he spoke were given to him to speak from the God of this creation. And only a few in context really leaned in to hear and trust what Jesus had to say. 
Most of them pushed him back. They challenged him. They labeled him as someone evil and and he shouldn't be trusted. They ran him out of town. The very words of God came from his mouth. Listen to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, because they're questioning, by what authority are you saying this? And their questions come out of almost envy, envious. They're envious of someone that commands such attention. I'm going to read to you Matthew 12. This is what they said. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It's only by Bezabel, the the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against himself is a laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, Jesus said, he's divided against himself. In other words, if I'm acting on the authority of Satan and I have cast out demons, what have I done? But I've divided the kingdom. He goes on to say, how then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Bezabel, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, They will be your judges. But if it is the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, or if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you now. So the chief priests and the elders within the the temple, they were just screaming at him. How can you say you're a mere man? You're a mortal man. How can you say such things? Matthew 21 says, He entered the temple and the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him up to him as he was teaching and, and said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Who gave you this authority? Jesus left little doubt. He, 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 he left little to question. The accusations that were hurled at him didn't daunt his ministry that was going to take him to Calvary, all the way to the cross. Why? Because the authority that Jesus had was given to him by the God of this creation, our Heavenly Father. And so he demonstrated this evidence of authority. Not only did he speak it with authority... He demonstrates it. In our text, point number two in your outline, the evidence then of one in authority. As we look at the text this morning, I'm going to go outside the text for a few of these points because I want you to see the whole picture of the authority that Jesus has over our universe and over our hearts. First thing is, he has authority over nature. In Matthew 8, just as a reminder, as I go to a couple of the other Gospels to give you some examples. In Matthew 8, Jesus calms a great storm on the Sea of Galilee that he's by, just by rebuking the winds and the sea. He claims authority over nature. You remember the men in the boat, they were, they were amazed by what they said. Of course they were. And so they said, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Where does he get this authority? Later in Matthew 14, Jesus is seen walking on the waters on the sea. And Peter, you remember, he bolsters up enough faith that he steps out of the boat and he walks momentarily, at least a little bit, but momentarily he walks before he takes his eyes off of Jesus and then he sinks and those powerful waves come over him and of course Jesus saves him. Peter gets back into the boat, you remember, and then what happens when Jesus gets in the boat? The winds and the waves, they cease. And those in the boat were heard saying, truly you are the Son of God. He has authority over nature. He has authority over sickness. 
He has authority over sickness. Jesus is, is seen healing fevers, right? The blind, the lame. And then, after he ascends back into the heaven, the disciples, they continue this domination over sickness by simply exercising the authority that he had given them. In the name of Jesus, walk. It was the authority that Jesus had given them over nature, over sickness. He has authority over sin. He has authority over sin, number three. In what ways did Jesus demonstrate this authority over sin? We have to ask the question, and the answer is he forgave sin. That was how he demonstrated his authority over sin was he forgave sin. And who can forgive sin? Only God. Only God. Look at the evidence in Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verses 1 through 3 says, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. What? Your sins are forgiven. Who can say that? Who can say your sins are forgiven? Later, he got into the boat. He, he crossed over the sea. He came to another city and he saw some people there and, and there was another paralytic and he, he said to them, take heart, your sins are forgiven. This man, they cried out as blasphemy. Where does he get this authority? How can he forgive sin? Listen to the evidence, even, even the gospel of Luke gives us evidence of this it says in, verse, in chapter 7, he turned towards this woman and he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And then he turned to her and said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Of course, our passage this morning, we see that he has authority over evil. Verses 23 through 28, he encounters this man now after Jesus was teaching in the synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit, a demon, Diabolos. By the way, that's a noun. It's not a characteristic. It's not an adjective. It's a noun. It's a person, a created supernatural being rebellious and hostile to God and to anyone that was allied to God. To be, to be demon-possessed in that day was to be under his influence and dare, might I say, today as well. A synonymous identity would be, as we see it in the text this morning, an unclean spirit. An evil spirit would be another synonymous description but indeed a demon. We see evidence of this even in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 17, they sacrificed to demons that were no gods. Talking about the nations around them, that they were sacrificing to demons. In Psalm 106, and by the way, the only two places in the Old Testament that the word demons is even mentioned is in Deuteronomy and in Psalms. In Psalm 106, it says they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. To the demons. What a horrible, evil, sinful act stemmed from the heart of man. And Jesus confronts this evil found in this man and demonstrates his authority. 
This man's in the synagogue. Do you hear me? In the synagogue, listening to what's being taught by the one who has authority over him. He has power. He has authority over the demons. The text says there was a man with an unclean spirit. It's a demon. 63 times that word is used in the New Testament. Who or what is a demon? Most likely a fallen angel. Mark calls them unclean spirit in the text, and he does this 11 times. Mark uses the word demon 13 times. It's for real. Powerful personalities and and, and their activity must have increased immensely during the times of Jesus. And for us, the warning is that as time comes to an end, as we see in John's vision, that activity picks up again. They have a authority and, and they can promote disunity and they can they can influence false doctrine and they can inflict disease and they can cause mental difficulties and they can listen they can hinder christian growth they have that kind of influence demons are for real they oppress the christ-centered person but they never possess the christ-centered person here in our text A demon-possessed man in all places, guys. A house of worship. That should concern us today. We shouldn't assume that our own churches are beyond the evil, demonic influence that we see in our text. But Jesus has authority over the demons. Knowing that, the, the, the demons recognize him, don't they? They, 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 they issue a, 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 a cry out. It's like, get away! You're all powerful! Move out of our way! What does he say to them? Silence! And they obey him. They obey him. Come out! And they do immediately. And it says as a result, his, his fame spread everywhere. That's what the text says. Not just around Galilee now, but all the surrounding regions. He's become famous, Jesus has. People were hearing the good news of the kingdom that was now everywhere. And this one who was speaking has authority. Not in our passage this morning, but a reality that has to be referenced is the authority that Jesus has over death. Number five, he has authority over death. Several narratives really demonstrate that. Just offer a few, just just for your reminder. The ruler of the synagogue's daughter died. Jesus went to his home, and there was a crowd that gathered around to mourn, and Jesus took the girl by the hand, and what happened? The girl arose from the dead. Another one is the son of a widow in a town called Nain had died. Jesus goes into the town, and the boy is being actually carried out of his home, and there's a crowd around gathering, they're mourning. And Luke writes that Jesus had this great compassion over the mother and told her not to weep any longer. And then Luke writes that he just touched the boy and he said to the boy, Arise. And he did just that and he began to speak. The most talked about one, right, that should come to your memory quickly would be Lazarus. We're all familiar with that story. Maybe, though, maybe we're too familiar with the story and it no longer grips our heart. But Jesus spoke life into a dead man's heart. Lazarus, come out. And he did. (laughs) In front of many witnesses. 
And yet, there's one more. There's one more dramatic and authoritative demonstration of his command over death. In Matthew 28, he declares himself, The angel said to the women, Don't be afraid, for he's not here. He has risen. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Absolute authority. In all of those illustrations that I've given you, he demonstrated authority. The teaching of that authority is what we see next. He, he taught with authority. Jesus' authority is recognized in his words. His, he, he's teaching with this authority. The people that came around the teachings of Jesus, the, the scribes and the, and the teachers of the law that were all there... They, they, they taught just in contrast to the way Jesus taught. Just in contrast. They, they, they just verbalized. They would read from the Torah, but there was no teaching. This man, Jesus, they said, taught like no one has ever taught before. He teaches with authority. Jesus never put them down because of the position that they had. Because... For the people, it was an honor to sit under the instructions of the scribes and the teachers of the law. But they stood in opposition to Jesus and his ministry. Jesus wasn't challenging the legitimacy of their office, but he was challenging the legalism and the hypocrisy and the pride that he was hearing. In, the, in this context with these Pharisees and scribes and these religious rulers, if, if, listen, if, if, if some people fear that they're too bad to be saved, th this was a group of people that really felt that they were too good to be saved. And Jesus was calling them out. That, by the way, is a danger in our churches today. Especially in those who have been raised in a Christian home. It's good that you've been raised in a Christian home, but as I've said to my children and my grandchildren, your faith is your faith, not your father or your grandfather's faith. You must stand before the one who has authority by yourself. Jesus claimed his authority was from God as he taught. That authority is recognized even in the darkness Jesus' authority is recognized even in the darkness. Because in our text, what does it say about these demons? It says they were afraid. They saw Jesus. The demons cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? And then they say this, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. They're, they're concerned about his intentions. That's what they're concerned about. They recognize the threat that Jesus has over their authority and their power. They, they confess it openly. Jesus, you're the Holy One of God. It's, it's like they recognized his deity. They did. They, they recognized his sonship. They did. And the difference that existed between what was unholy and unclean. They saw him as the Holy One of God. That's the language they used. Other places will will see that they'll use words like the Son of the Son of the Most High God. Or they'll say that He is the Son of God. It's interesting to me as I did the study that those who the one who has authority, Jesus, over sickness and disease, when he healed them, they didn't refer to him that way. The demons did, Son of God, the Most Holy One. But those who were healed said, He's Lord. He's the Teacher. He's the Son of David. He's the Master. Isn't that interesting? Those who the one 
Jesus had divine authority over and touched. They were correct for sure. But the demons, they had this theology that's just eerie. Their view of Jesus' identity is is undoubtedly, undoubtedly above our own. They knew who he was. And they knew what his authority was. And they were afraid. They were afraid. Demons are forced to acknowledge then that the Father declared that. What Jesus, what the Father declared in verse 11, he says, You are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So we have Jesus' authority demonstrated in the darkness. And in the darkness was the crowd, right? They're, they're, they're just as, as a part of the darkness because they didn't know who he was either. But verse 22 says they were amazed. They were amazed. They, they recognized that there was no scribe, there was no rabbi that taught with the clarity and the authority that Jesus did. His teachings astonished them. That's what verse 22 says. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. Not as the scribes. Mark Mark tells us absolutely nothing about the content of what Jesus taught. Nothing. Mark in this passage, is focusing on the one who is teaching. He's focusing on his authority. He's focusing on the astonishing responses of those listening. The demons and the crowds, the scribes, the rulers. They were amazed. They were alarmed. What's our takeaway? Our takeaway is that his teachings were disturbing. Today, we might say they were just simply blown away by what he had to say, the authority behind his words. They were amazed, verse 27. What is this? A new teaching with authority? So he's recognized even by his opposition. They hear him, they see, they know this is someone special, they question it. What is this? But Jesus, teaching with authority, he threatens the religious rulers' authority and and those that that had been kept oppressed by their their man-made rules and their laws and their regulations. That threat, by the way, followed him all the way to Calvary. Listen to Matthew 26. It says, Then the high priest tore his robes and he said, He's uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, He deserves death. And they spit on his face and they struck him and they slapped him. The authority of Jesus granted to him by the Father, the God of creation, The one who had authority over over nature, over sickness, over sin, over evil, over death. So threatened the heart of man. A a heart that, that really craved to rule over themselves without the interference of any outside lordship authority. It propelled them to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. But Jesus wasn't to be silenced. And before he ascended back to the Father, he delegated this authority that I'm laying at your feet here this morning. I'm trying to convince you of this awesome authority that Jesus had. And that authority he's given to you and I as disciples, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's delegated, delegated to us, you and me, authority. In what way might I substantiate that? Well, I stand here, and Craig did last Sunday. We stand here based on the authority that he's given us to preach his name. 
Jesus' followers carry on the same message of repentance and the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew 10 says, And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' followers also serve in His name. We preach in His name and we serve in His name. John 14 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in Me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will He do because I'm going to the Father. We preach in His name based on His authority. We serve in His name based on the authority that He's given us. And Jesus' followers offer forgiveness in His name. Listen to what Paul wrote to the first century church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That authority, that's your authority. It's my authority given to us from the one who has the ultimate authority. And with that authority comes instructions. Matthew 6, 11 says, If any place that you go doesn't receive you and they don't listen to you, walk away. Leave. Shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. But listen, you did what God had called you to do. You spoke with authority into the lives of those who needed to hear the one who has the ultimate authority, and they rejected just as they rejected him. So I want us to take into our communion now some encouragement. Go into the communion table with some encouragement this morning. The exaltation of the one who has the ultimate authority in our lives. I want us to affirm together, together, that Jesus is the Holy One of God. The exaltation of that authority. One, quickly, He is Lord. Exalt over that. If you know Christ in your life, know His Lordship. He is Lord. He has authority the disturbance that's in man's heart and the imprisonment of the demons that we saw in our text. They serve as the principles of evil that has begun. Life will never be the same because the one who has authority has come to this world to live among us. He is Lord. The demons have been cast aside. Broken people's hearts are made whole. That's God's kingdom. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And that's why Jesus should have absolute authority in your life and in, in my life and in everyone's life. He's Lord. And we should exalt Him as Lord. Philippians 2 says, God highly exalted Him and bestowed upon Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. He's Lord. He also is judge. Acts 17 says, because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness. He is Lord and He is judge. Our coming together to have communion is, is, is with the King of Kings. It, 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 he's with the Lord of Lords and He is with our Savior. He is Savior.
He is our Savior. John 3.15 says clearly, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So we humbly now, humbly, come into his presence this morning as he left us with this promise. I want you to look at this on the board. This is what I want you to see. This is the promise that I want you to see. John 14.3. John 14. John 14.3. This is to take us into our communion. Based on the authority of Jesus Christ. He says, I go and I prepare a place for you. I'll come again and I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And I just want you to hear me say that I'm saying that to you based on the authority of the one who gave me the authority to say it to you. Jesus was given an authority that as God changed lives for eternity. And his followers, you and me, were representatives of that authority. And that authority is still changing lives today. Still changing lives today. And by the way, that change is for eternity. Father, thank you again that we have a text there this morning that demonstrates to us that we, we do not live life as we should. We do not live lives based on the authority of of self. We are to live our life based on the authority that you've given us to yield to. The lordship, the saviorship authority over our lives. But Father, the sadness of this text is there are many in churches throughout our nation and in wor our world that are meeting right now that are under the influence of the evil one to reject the lordship, the authority. They're just like the crowds. They listen and yet are just amazed at what they hear, but they don't embrace it. They, they don't yield to it. They don't allow it to take authority over them. Father, I I pray for this body of people, this small group that's met here this morning. I, I pray that we walk out of here encouraged. Encouraged that you have ultimate authority over nature, over sickness, over evil, over sin, and over death. And that we have a message to take to a world that needs to hear about that authority. Give us the boldness and the courage to do that, I pray. Encourage us. In Jesus' name, I pray. God's people said, Amen. You have in your hands elements of the communion table, a wafer and juice. You can see that it's carefully wrapped. There's a very thin covering on the top. You pull that apart and you'll pull out a wafer. Let me read this to you, if I may, before we take it. It says that when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. It's for you. Remember, he said. Remember that in his humanness he suffered pain and agony and he suffered the wrath of God because he took your sin and my sin upon himself so that we could be forgiven by our trusting and believing in the body. Eat. Eat. And remember.
And then if you carefully peel back the covering, you'll see the juice, and it says, In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I want to just emphasize that new covenant, the word covenant promise. It's a new promise. We get to, by faith, trust in the complete work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You and I get to do that. We get to remember by reflecting back what Jesus completed on the cross when he cried out, it is finished. We get to remember that we're not driven by self-righteousness anymore. We're driven by his righteousness. We are brothers and sisters in Christ because we remember what Jesus has done for us. Let's drink together. Father, thank you for your vast love. Thank you for bringing us to this communion table that we could just remember, momentarily remember, that it was with your authority that Jesus came to this world. It's with your authority that he lived some 33 years on this planet. It's with your authority that he taught and loved and showed compassion and healed and cast out evil. It was on your authority that he went to the cross. It was on your authority that he was slaughtered on the cross. It was on your authority that he shed his blood. And it was on your authority that he said that whosoever believeth in him should never perish, but have everlasting life. And for that we rejoice. In Christ's name I pray. God's people said, Amen.